Hey folks, my name is Matt Engel. Welcome back to Living in the Virtues of Your Strengths, where we are exploring uh, how to live Clifton Strengths virtuously. There's a lot of podcasts out there saying how to name, claim, and aim those strengths. We want to know here, how do we tame these strengths? How do we live them virtuously, avoid those overuse patterns, but also leverage them as fuel for sanctity? How do we live in our signature theme so that we might become saints and conform ourselves to the design that God has for each one of us, the plan that God has for each one of us? So today, specifically, we're going to be talking about relationship, the domains. We're diving into our four parts series here, mini series within this full series of the domains, starting with relationship. And so some people ask, why are we starting with the domains? Why aren't we getting right into the signature themes? Well, what I love about the domains, and you see the very first thing on your full report, if you've ever gotten your full reports, it says uh, you lead with one of these domains, whether it's relationship, whether it's strategic thinking, execution, or influence, influencing. So today we're going to be exploring what does it mean to lead with that relationship domain? What are the virtuous ways that we can lead within this domain? What are the vicious ways that we might be inclined to lean in this domain? And then ultimately, what are the mindsets behind both? What we find is what we're, whether we're showing up virtuously or viciously in our talents, in our signature themes here, uh, oftentimes we can take a look at the mindset behind it. What is driving us ultimately? What's the belief, the perception? the motivation ultimately. So we're going to be talking a lot about motivation here today, and I am excited for this. I do like uh, reiterating our backdrop for this, is as we talk about virtue and vice, we're laying the foundation with this Catholic anthropology. And if you haven't listened to the first episode, we dive into this a little bit more, but just to kind of do a quick reiteration of this, we have three main points for that Catholic anthropology, right? That understanding of how God created us and for what God created us, right? First off, created in the image and likeness of God. We have the supreme dignity amongst creation, and that's grounded very much in the fact that we have an intellect and a will, an intellect that gives us freedom, endows us with freedom, but also that God became man so that man might become God. Within the person of Jesus Christ through grace, we now have the capacity with God's grace to enter into a divine relationship. This is all part of being made in the image and likeness of God, and it ties into that ultimate destiny. So living out our strengths, we want to make sure that it's uh, moving us in this direction of this divine relationship. That's our beatitude. That's what we were created for. We are a body-soul composite. All right, so we're not looking at these things dualistically. We are body, soul composites. And finally, we are created male and female. That's going to tie in quite a bit here as we're talking about relationships. And we'll be even discussing a little bit this thing that John Paul II talks about called the spousal analogy. In fact, let's get into that right now. So John Paul II in his Theology of the Body really leaned on this anthropology, and he draws out this concept called the spousal analogy. And what do we see from this? Well, the spousal analogy is where you have two coming together, and from that, from that union, there is fruit. There's a fruitfulness. And we can see this not only image very profoundly in marriage, in the marital act where the husband and wife come together consummate the marriage. And in many senses, there are fruits of a new life, certainly fruits of union between the two, but also the fruits of new life often that come forth from that. And very <laughs> extraordinary circumstances, if you come to understand that deeper. But we can take this and draw an analogy and look at all of creation, all of our relationships in terms of this spousal analogy, where there's somebody that has something to give, there's somebody that has a poverty, and that person with that poverty is open to receive from the person that has the gift to give. And when they come together, there is not just a one plus one equals two, but there's something greater that comes from that. There's a superabundance, there's a fecundity that comes from that. And this song, this heaven song is playing all around us, folks, if we have the eyes 
to see. And so as we consider the way that the signature themes in the relationship domain show up, let us fall back a little bit on this spousal analogy of John Paul II and see how they show up as gifts or how they receive very well. Also, John Paul II's personalism. We have five tenets that we highlight here on this podcast with that. First is the absolute dignity of persons. Second is persons are self-deterministic in this. Every person has a unique personal end, and it's a freedom to choose their end. Something we need to note, right? What does that mean? We all have goals, and we all have a desire to fulfill those goals. Every person has this or should have that. That's the personalistic norm John Paul II highlights. Third, we have self, we are capable of self-possession. Persons have an interior life and the ability to be aware of this and have the ab absolute freedom to govern and choose their own acts. And the beautiful thing about this self-possession is it enables us to be self-gift and enter into this self-donation. Persons are made for communion. There's that spousal analogy, right? and come to know themselves in communion with one another. Does this mean that we have license to use one another so that we can come to know who we are? No. John Paul II says that the opposite of loving a person is to use them as a means to an end, to objectify them. And the only proper response to a person is love. Love, love, love. What's the foundation for uh, loving relationship in John Paul II's personalistic norm? It's when two or more people share a common personal end that they are willing freely to pursue together, right? It's a marriage relationship. To come together in a marriage, they want to pursue the personal end, the good, the common good of a good, healthy marriage. And they will that independently together. Certainly, there's some discovery of that and unfolding as your marriage goes on for those people that are married, uh, especially those that have been married for decades. We know that our understanding of what a beautiful marriage is, is evolving as we come to grow in our understanding of what that is. So let's dive here into the relationship domain. I'll be asking you all a question here in a moment, but just a quick uh, overview. All right, so we've got nine themes in the relationship domain. What are those nine themes? Also referred to as talents. Okay, they are adaptability, connectedness, developer, empathy, harmony, includer, individualization, positivity, and relator. Moving through these very quickly, because we're going to be having podcasts dedicated to each one of these, adaptability, and so this is not going to be an exhaustive exploration of these. We have time for that in some later podcasts, but here, adaptability, just think, go with the flow. I really like that. Go with the flow. Very easy going. Connectedness. Serendipitous. Everything happens for a reason. Reason. Developer. I got you, babe. I'm right here. I'm alongside you. I see the potential and I'm with you on the journey. Empathy. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. I want to share the load. I want to share the, emo the emotional load, especially the tough stuff. Harmony. Everybody has a beautiful perspective and we benefit from acknowledging the beautiful perspective everyone has to offer. Includer. Let's find those people on the outside and bring them to the inside. They've got something to, to contribute. Individualization. The custom approach to each person is the best approach. Every person is unique and therefore needs a unique approach. Positivity. Can we increase the emotional temperature in the room, please? positivity always sees that silver lining and they just have a default to seeing the good. And then finally, relator. Don't bore me with small talk. Let's go deep. Let's go deep. So a lot of us on this call here 
have these relationship themes. Maybe even we lead with them. And again, if you look to your report on that very first page of the full 34 report, on the right side, you'll see a little gray box. And in it, at the very top, it'll say which theme you lead with. Now, you may say, hey, it says I lead with relationship, but my number one and two are, are influencer themes. I don't understand how the algor algorithm works, but Gallup does. They've been doing this for a long time. And so they find that based on it's looking at an algorithm, the arrangement, the ordering, and the intensity of your talents, and it comes up with a theme that you lead with. Okay. These themes that we lead with from my exploration, from talking with other people, really dive into what motivates us. And when I say what motivates us, what I mean is what, where do we desire? It's not what, but where do we desire to ultimately rest? Where do we desire to ultimately rest? And so well, the first question I have for you guys, and again, protocol for this call, raise your hand. If you want to come on and speak, you can certainly share something, type something in the chat, and I'm happy to share it uh, aloud with uh, the rest of the group and for people that are listening on the podcast. But we really want to hear from you as well. So feel free to uh, unmask yourself or just leave yourself masked if you just want to be a talking uh, title on the Zoom call here. Uh, but think about this. For people who lead with relationship, what drives you? That's the question. What drives you? And even those people that don't lead with relationship, what do you think? Or what have you seen? Because I know we've interacted with people that lead with relationship. What have you seen that drives people? I call on somebody in three seconds. And I know she leads in relationship. Elizabeth says, peace. I want, to, I want everyone to understand each other. Elizabeth, what are, your, uh, what are your top five themes that you got? Share that in there. I love that peace. I think of Augustine. He talks about peace as the tranquility of order. Right? We're resting in the tranquility of order. And Elizabeth, I want everyone to understand each other. That's interesting. Because oftentimes, and everybody wants to understand each other is something a little bit more strategic thinking. It's kind of where I would go. But interesting. All right, Elizabeth shares empathy, belief, restorative input, and intellection. Michelle Dunn. Calling in. Mm -hmm. I know that you lead with relationships. I am seven out of Actually, 15. you leave us. Yes. So, so here's the thing. I'm seven out of 15 relationship, but I'm four out of 10 relationship and four out of 10 strategic thinking. So when you're talking about what I lead with, I, it's almost equal relationship strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. But I need to make connection before I can make use of my strategic thinking. Does that make sense? It does. So for me, can you paint relationship, a picture of what that looks like? Yeah, relation, so relationship means connection. So I'm high connectedness. So I like to I like to connect deeply with the people in the room, even, even though that sounds like relater. But um then I there's also this need to sort of trust that I'm accepted into the group, that what I have to say matters, you know, all of those things. And you can even, and we could take that off into a tangent but um trust is a is a big word for relationship builders um knowing that not that you're going to do what you say you're going to do but that you're going to be who you say you're going to be and that you're showing up authentically so authentic relationship is is a, a big one for me authentic so so when we talk about what moves you what drives you where you ultimately want to rest where you desire to rest is in authentic relationship. Yeah. Great. You know, I know there's a couple of people that listen to Simon Hurry's podcast and he explored the relationship theme and he really highlighted that word trust that you shared uh, in terms of this is where the, the motivation. And as I thought about this and I brought my strategic thinking themes to the table, because that's where I live. 
is um, I started to think, well, is trust really where we want to rest or is trust a means to an end? Is rather trust the means to achieving the desired result where we want to ultimately end. I tend to believe that Justin's got his hand raised before I offer my thoughts. Justin, please come on and share. No, I, I, I definitely think you're on to something with trust is almost a, uh, a commodity <laughs> within the relationship building domains in that it's, it's how you know who to interact with and how and to what extent. Um, and some of the themes are are more liberal in their their distribution of those goods. Some are more reserved, but um, all of them use it as that that mechanism for understanding how best to interact with and and ultimately i mean going back to your list with the personalism um i think the that concept of love is the proper response to to another human being to me that's what really drives um this domain um the you know the different domains kind of give you a way of how you reason with the world. I mean, we think of strategic thinking, for example, as thinking, but thinking is a form of reasoning, just like interacting with the people in your life is a way of reasoning, is a way of navigating your world. And for me, the, the relationship building themes navigate the world through the people that A, are close and B, can be close. Um, to understand um, love is the proper response. Well, how do I properly respond to you as the individual standing in front of me? Um, some really, really, really want to trust you. Some are a little more reserved, like your relator. But you know, in every case, there is this this kind of pinging of trust off the other person, and almost like a radar, seeing what bounces back to to feel them out and to see, you know, how quickly can we move forward in a mm, way that is safe and effective forward. for both of us. Got so. it. And that, that moving forward, what do we, how are we defining that? How quickly can we move forward, move forward to what? I think the willingness to give and receive each other as gift, like you said, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, I, I think you're dead on in that we all want to be able to give ourselves to others and then trust that the, the same will happen in return. You know, everybody loves the idea of uh, unconditional love. And I think that's what this theme or this domain more than any others promotes is how can we get to that point where we move past our conditions because originally there there shouldn't have been conditions. And I think relationship building domain understand that, that it shouldn't be this way. We shouldn't have to guard ourselves, yet we do. Um, and so, you know, the, the themes in this domain really, I think, figure out how to navigate around that, quote unquote, the way should be, you know, sub like adaptability, just kind of chuck it out the window and, they just take their chances that if it doesn't mm -hmm. work, well, then they'll move on. But, you know, in some like relator or almost the opposite, we're like, okay, I really want to trust you, but you got to give me something. Right. So, right. So we're caught with these relationship themes. One of the things that you highlighted that they do very, 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 very well. And I'd say that it's a strength and a witness that they give is this witness of unconditional love. They really do have a disposition for it where, you know, some of the other domains may be a little bit more calculate, calculative in their approach to a relationship. There is, there is a sense of self-abandonment that is just natural for those people that are high in relationship themes. This doesn't mean that you don't have it, right? If, you're, if you lead with some of the other domains, all it means is that you image God in that self-abandonment, perhaps, because I always got to honor the nuances in the way that this shows up in each individual. 
But perhaps those people that are high relationship, they image the image God and his just fidelity a little bit more. Here's kind of when I was I was thinking, okay, we're ultimately rest and we've kind of hit around it, but let me see how this lands. The motivation ultimately for relationship is to rest in communion. Rest in communion. Okay, I'm seeing some heads nodding here. Because when we think of communion, again, common union, we have that spousal analogy that's showing up here where the two are becoming one. And there is, it's not just even a rest of communion in itself, but that communion is something that has a, a, a fertility with it. Uh, there's something new that's created when we enter into relationships that did not exist before. Jane, I see your hand raised, please. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. Um, when I, before I took my strengths, I was always identified as a people person because uh, as my husband identifies me as a social butterfly, I love people, I get motivated, I'm energized, blah, blah, blah. When I took my strengths, I was, it was a wonderment because my main domain is strength, uh, strategic thinking. Um, and it really threw me for a loop because I, in the past, my, my childhood family ne never identified me. I was never really the smart one. Uh, all my other brothers and sisters were the smart ones. Um, but as I've learned about the strengths, positivity is number two for me. And mm. woo is number four. Four is not a, a relationship builder, which I always think is interesting, but it's an influencer. But the two go hand in hand. And number 10 is connectedness. So I see everything. And... Mm -hmm. I'm not a spring chicken. I'm not quite in my fourth quarter of my life, but I'm almost there. And so I've realized that this is absolutely true, this rest and communion. And what I've discovered in my own um, studying of the strengths and using my strengths is that I love to have relationship when I can have that deep thinking with others. So for instance, Monday, my goddaughter and I, we were going to go for a hike. It, it ended up, we went for an eight mile hike and we stopped for coffee for an hour and a half. And we were just having these deep, amazing, and I always think of like, um, who is it? The sister of, uh, oh gosh. Was it Benedict and Scholastica when Scholastica was like, well, I prayed for God for rain so I could stay and talk to you all night. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, yes, story. yes. <laughs> he was like, wait, you, you can't stay here. This is the night and you can't, a woman can't be in the monastery. And she's like, well, I want to still talk about God. Um, so that common, re, common, the rest in communion, right? So I, I realized personally that one of the things, um, so that was one experience this weekend. And then another experience, we were blessed with Carlo Cutis and San Manuel Garcia's relics coming to our parish on Friday. So I invited a friend to come and have lunch. And then we all went to the church and we just celebrated. And one of the, the women, she's Spanish, and, and she asked me, like, how did how do you how do you have this joy? Like ever since I've known you, she's known me for about 12 years now she's like ever since I've known you you just have this joy of of people mm -hmm. and I'm like because I love Jesus and that's my motivation I want as many people to know Jesus as possible and if you don't mm -hmm. know him then I'm going to introduce you to him and if you do know him then I'm going to have these deep relationships with you these deep conversations about him and so that's kind of going back to the Catholic aspect of it and how the two relationship builder and strategic thinker are complementary. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. We even see some complementarity, some communion amongst the different strengths that we have here. And it's amazing how these, and you, you see it, like how these, the signature themes, depending on the order that they're in, it's almost like they give birth to these new nuances of how they show up in each person's life. So awesome, Jane, thanks so much for that. Gonna pivot now folks to start talking about the, uh, the 
virtuous side of things, okay? And so be pulling a bit from strengths language, but defining this thing in terms of this primary motivation, right? Again, we're, we're playing with this idea that the person that leads with relationship or the relationship themes are linked together in this domain, relationship domain, by this common desire to rest in communion, perhaps in some nuanced ways. So virtuous side, we think of it leads to interdependence, leveraging that strengths language there. So what does this look like? The interdependent person, I see my strengths and weaknesses and those of others and see them as an opportunity for communion. What do I mean by this? If I am terrible in one area of work and I know it, it doesn't benefit me to fake that I'm good at it. It doesn't benefit the team. Rather, it benefits me to find somebody who is good at that and lean on them or give them the task, right? Our weaknesses are almost like an open wound, womb, excuse me, womb, W-O-M-B, like an open womb that is waiting for somebody that has the gift to give. There's that spousal analogy of it. And so our weaknesses allow us to enter into that receptive posture of John Paul II's spousal analogy. And our strengths allow us to enter into that self-gift posture of John Paul II's spousal analogy. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, we both will experience what it means to be the giver, and we both will experience what it means to be the receiver. Even though when we look at our bodies, the woman's body speaks this in a very profound way, receptivity, and the man's body speaks very profoundly, giver, initiator of the gift. So consider this, the virtuous side, I want to hear from you guys. Where have you seen or experienced your relationship themes helping you to enter into communion? or even your weaknesses in any of your themes. Like We don't even have to talk about relationships here, but the goal being to rest in some sort of communion, where have we experienced that in our lives? I see, Michelle, you've written in here earlier, strong desire for communion, just like Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, you had said peace earlier. Love that. So I'm hitting you all with some very deep, questions here. I'm going to start calling on people in the group here. So don't you worry. Don't you worry. Like folks, it does not matter if you trip over what you're going to say or what you've got something to give. I'm inviting you to be in the posture of the giver right now to the people that are listening on this call and participating on this right now. Come Holy Spirit. All right. Looks like we got a hand raised. Who's got the hand raised? Jane, is that still your hand raised, or are you coming back on? The hand is down. Is there something challenging about the question? Like, I think, for example, I'm low in empathy. It's in my bottom five. Right, and that empathy, that relationship theme, is one of those, uh, one of those ones that allows you to just experience and desire to remain in the experience of somebody else's emotions, particularly the ones that are strug you're, you're struggling with. Okay, uh, I know this about myself, and so knowing this, I've I've found that I need to kind of lean a little bit on some of my other uh, signature themes, right, to, um, uh, to really rest in those emotions a little bit more, because sharing in the emotional life is a deeply personal way of experiencing another person. It's a whole other aspect of communion that I know people that are high in empathy, they experience it very readily. Uh, Elizabeth, you are empathy number one. Please come on and share. You inspired me. <laughs> um, 
no, that's definitely a, a huge, it was weird to actually see it because I didn't really know where um, the assessment was going to go. And then when empathy hit first, I've had that, um, honestly, I've had it given to me as a strength and as a weakness sometimes. Um, because as a strength, I, I tend to be a go-to person in my family for people's concerns and problems and end up sort of playing peacemaker because I can enter into whoever's talking. I can really enter into what they're saying and what they're feeling. And um, it's very judgment-free. Um, as soon as they start talking, I, I can see the process of their thoughts and why they got to where they're, they're going. Um, but then the flip side, judgment, judgment free, you said, yes, judgment free in a big way. Um, but then the flip side is I can't always look at their situations objectively and try to help. Uh, so I have other people in my life who can step in and do that and be like, well, well, let's like problem solve. And I'm like, oh, we can't problem solve That's There's too much. There's too much going on here. It's too much pain. We can't. It's there's. It's just we have to sit here with them. <laughs> so to have other people come into my life and be like, no, no, like we can work through this. It's just you know, it's such an. It's so interesting to be able to see the pros and cons of this strength and you know. Yeah, and when you hear people say, "Let's problem solve." The non-feelers in the room, the non-empathy people in the room, are often when they say problem solve, it's like. How do we get away from this emotion or how do we help this person to solve the problem of this emotion? And the people that are high empathy are saying, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's just theirs. And we don't have to fix it. We don't have to get away from it. We can just abide with them in that moment. How does that land? Exactly. That's exactly how it feels. Like, let's just, let's just be present instead of trying to solve everything right away. <laughs> Got it. Got it. And where you said also, this can show up as kind of viciously, and we're going to get to that in a, in a moment here, uh, is when what? When does it show up on kind of, say, the overuse side, so to speak? Um, I think two ways. I think one is that um, just sitting there forever, there's no progress. Um, Got it. And I would say also, um, it can come off as insincere because I, if I can hear separate sides of the same argument and totally empathize with each side and then realize that it sounds like I'm agreeing with both sides, which isn't possible. <laughs> um, so which can lead to friction in the relationships because it's like, well, wait a minute, you said this to me, but now you're saying this to this person and it sounds like you're just playing both sides of the field. And I'm like, I'm not trying to, but I can really enter in. <laughs> so I think it's that kind of, it can come off as insincere as well. Right. And it's, it's, there's a difference here between empathy and sympathy, which is, uh, I heard this definition and I was reading the book Unrepeatable, another great book that I recommend. Um, but, uh, the difference between empathy and sympathy is both are feeling what the other person is feeling. They're both capable. Empathy and sympathy are capable. Empathy just feels it. Sympathy says, I feel it. And I'm also aligned with you. I'm in agreement with you on this. So that's where it, we have to be conscious of where we are. Our empathy, yes, we are feeling the other person's, uh, what they're going through, but we may not necessarily agree with it or agree that it's appropriate for them to be feeling that emotion. We can just say that, okay, I can recognize that you're feeling this. For example, some people feel very passionately about some pretty vicious things. If you look in our media, there's a lot of debate going on about who the human person is and where life begins. And there's a lot of passion. The person that's empathet empathetic can feel that passion, but they can do it without being sympathetic, which is where I also agree with whatever's behind this emotion. And what do we know here at Metanoia Catholic? We look at our emotions as the products of a thought, a belief, a perception that we get to choose. And so where empathy can certainly be one of those things that can go in an overuse pattern is when we are uh, aligning ourselves with a group think perhaps, and we're abandoning reason in the process. 
right? We're, we're, we're aligning ourselves emotionally to somebody and we're sympathizing arguably in an area where uh, it's not necessarily conformed to reality um, or at least the belief system behind that emotion that the other person's experiencing. When I look at the virtuous mindset, I think something that's, uh, that's important for the person that leads with, uh, with uh, relationship building is, is to approach the relationship with the mindset or we are both distinct and free. We are both distinct and free. Again, falling back here on that personalistic norm, everybody has their distinct motivations, but also um, we are all free. We all have this. Um, and, and what does that mean? I, I think there could be a tendency, we'll get to here in the vicious side of things, where we can get intertwined with the other person. And when we don't see the other person as distinct, we can't receive them as gift, nor can we give ourselves to them as gifts. So it's something that is disruptive to relationship. And we talk about this in Metanoia Catholic, in our Metanoia Catholic Academy all the time, right, of being uh, emotionally unchaste or uh, in some sort of a, a emotional childhood, right? Where you think that your emotions are contingent on somebody else's thoughts and behaviors. It's like, no, that violates this, this mindset that, no, we're distinct. They get to think what they want. They get to feel what they want. And I get to choose how much I participate in that. But I am not bound to it, even though sometimes you're so inclined and may feel like you are not free to not feel, but you're always free to put boundaries up in place. And I think this allows us to actually be, um, to enter into a relationship with freedom, right? If there's no freedom, there's no love. Okay, so maintaining that virtuous mindset with our relationship building themes, I think it's very important here always to recognize that even though no matter how connected we feel, no matter how much we feel the other person's emotions, no matter how much we appreciate other people's opinions, that ultimately other people are distinct from us. And the beautiful part about that is now we get to freely enter into relationship, a loving relationship. It makes us capable of loving. All right, pivoting over here to the vicious side, which I'm sure everybody's going to be really excited to share examples of where relationship themes are showing up viciously. That's such a harsh word here. Showing up, say, like in overuse patterns or like in ways that just aren't leading to this rest and communion that we're looking for, right? So start to ponder some of those things as I go into uh, where... Uh, Relationship themes might rest in independence or codependence. Again, that strengths language drawing from here. So how does it rest in independence? I see my gifts, but only others' weaknesses. So I may give, but I never take or I never receive. Okay, so there's this I'm going independent. I'm closed off. There's almost a heart of stone right? A contracepted heart, a barrier over our heart that is in, impeding any sort of communion, right? If we have hearts of stone, if we have contraceptive hearts, we cannot conceive. It's a barrier to conception. It's a barrier to communion. It's a barrier to living out that spousal analogy. Okay. Or on the vicious side, it might lead to codependence, I see others' gifts, but only my weaknesses. So I'll take, but may never give. I may never give, but I will take. You see how this is also one that is just, it's a consuming relationship. Where apart from this other person, I can't stand alone. There's no self-possession. There's no self-determination. There's no self-donation that's going on here. We're never approaching the other person in a loving way, but rather in a codependent relationship where we see ourselves as not having any sort of gifts, only weaknesses. We will constantly be grasping at the other. There's fear 
that's motivating. Both of these, there's fear behind them. Fear of letting somebody else in or fear of having our gift rejected, perhaps. All right, Jane asks here, is that where narcissism would land in codependence? Perhaps, certainly can see where this goes, but we don't even have to go to the extreme end of clinical narcissism, right? We can read into narcissism and be like, okay, we all got a little bit of narcissism, a little bit of self-absorption that's going on here. But it's, it's kind of on that side of the spectrum, Jane, I would say that, yeah, it's leading to a place of consuming the other. The other person is a means to an end. It violates that personalistic tenet that we have of the person, the proper approach to the person is always love. Uh, Suzanne, I think there is another side to codependence. Suzanne, would you be willing to come on and share what you mean? Okay. Well, as I look at that, it immediately confuses me because um, I'm identified as codependent, but it's not that I only see other people's weaknesses and so I take, but I don't give. Um, it's, I, and I was thinking about this earlier because my number one is achiever, which really surprised me. I would have thought mine would be later and or empathy but those are actually you know down the line um how far down the line is empathy for uh, you well empathy is 13 okay it's really really shocking. still accessible <laughs> and relator is 18 but i functioned in my life as an empathetic relator however and the way, and the way also suzanne the way that there may be some things where you look at the, say, the description that Gallup provides for each one of these, and um, you may look at it and be like, okay, I, 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 I see that in my life, and there's evidence for that in my life. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that you don't have those. It may be the combination of some other themes working together that kind of drive the motivation. And so it's just a nuanced way that you show up empathetic and you show up going, desiring to go deep with people. Yeah, I really love what Justin yeah. said. And I took notes on that. Thank you, Justin. Um, but on the codependence thing, theme, um, and with my number one being achiever, I can now see through the work that I've done in Metanoia Catholic over the last year and all the journaling that in my relationships, whether with my husband or with girlfriends, other friends, um, sisters, uh, I, I would always be um, wanting to accomplish wonderful goals within the context of the relationship. And so in that sense, I became codependent in that I would give people too much of my time and not understanding that there's this give and take in relationship. And I think that comes from my um, childhood growing up and the, play, the part I played in my family of 10 uh, of, a, of a bringing people together kind of thing. So I'm, I, I developed this codependence according to one therapist anyway. Um, as a result, of too much giving um yeah so it's that's why i was surprised by the way you define codependence sure so i and what i'm hearing from you suzanne is the way that in this case codependence is showing up here and i'm just kind of trying to to look at this in in terms of of the uh the give and take aspect of a relationship um but and and this is certainly kind of even some extreme language that that that's here. It's just like almost almost that I don't ever give, I never give, I never take. So we're, I'm looking at this in terms of some extremes. So somewhere on on the part there, there's uh, and where you may be falling is okay. There's a need 
And I think the other person, I think what really what we're looking at is, is there a place in a relationship where we find ourselves grasping at another person or grasping at another person or we're tied to another person's acting a certain way or thinking a certain way so that we can feel a certain way about ourselves or we can get something in return or, or have that feeling of security, which I even hear in your story. Mm -hmm. um, that desire for security, all of us desire to rest. And I know Michelle Dunn, you're, you've done a lot of work in this area too. So feel free to jump in here, Michelle. We desire to rest in that secure attachment, that confidence in the other and the confidence in ourselves as well and in, in, in our dignity, right? Michelle, anything to add there? And I see Justin, you have your hand raised too. Yeah, just, I think what you're describing, Matt, is that need to see and be seen and, and be known, right, mm -hmm. by another. And, and I think what I hear Suzanne saying, and, and some of what, some of that resonates for me too, but in kind of a different way, sometimes when your, um, your relationships strengths combine in a particular way, um, mm -hmm. not feeling seen, not being heard or understood, can also result in like blocking your feelings. So when you're high empathy, high harmony, even high connectedness, some of those other things, um, sometimes you can you can see, well, I think I'm giving all of this and I'm not receiving as much. So now I'm just gonna kind of block that out and go to independence, right? So it doesn't even have to be codependence necessarily. Um, you can you can use all those relationship building strengths to go to independence because you think you're giving and giving and giving and you don't know how to take that's where independence is and then codependence i i don't know suzanne i'm, I'm hearing something different from you um like it's almost that fear to give now you've given and given and given and now there's that fear of like huh that didn't work i don't think i'm gonna do that anymore is that where you're going with that? Well, that rings true, Michelle. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a time in my life because of Metanoia Catholic Academy, I'm, I'm learning so much and I feel like a hermit. So that rings true what you're saying there. I've always been so social. Mm. I feel like a hermit. You've always been social. We're kind of going journeying, journeying inward here. Justin, you got your hand raised. Yeah, and uh, and I think listening to this too, and you know, it's easier to see the extremes than kind of the the mushy middle, but um, I, I think it's easy for, especially the, the talents within this theme and probably those who lead with it to, it's easy to slip between thinking we're loving someone and managing someone. So, and, you know, managing can look like a lot of things, but it's, to me, it's kind of a move towards the less virtuous direction in that you, you're you loving them on your own conditions. Um, now, maybe because you need to, maybe it's the type of relationship, and it could be that's the best way to love them, be, but it's a, uh, a kind of a fear of being overwhelmed. I know that's something that, you know, I deal with. I can, I have high developer, high empathy, I relater, um, and those are all very kind of passive in the sense relationship building themes and that they they react to what's going on, you know, as opposed to something like a connectedness or adaptability where you can just kind of bounce in there and, you know, be more go of the flow with people. Um, and so with that, you know, my fear, rational or otherwise, is this kind of sensing of being overwhelmed. So I can... I know I have the ability, if I want to, to make myself seem more present to someone than I actually am, so that I can divert them away and, 
give myself what I think I need is breathing room, you know, and sometimes I do need that. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just, I don't feel like dealing with you and, you know, bad on me for feeling that way in a sense, because there may be something I can actually do for you. And I'm, I'm avoiding that for whatever reason. Um, and so, I mean, the, I, I definitely don't claim to be an expert on the concept of, you know, codependency or, or anything like that, but I think it's that I, I know I can respond to people in a certain way that shows them love, or I can respond to people in a certain way that makes them think I'm showing them love when in fact I am just trying to put them in a box for now because I don't feel like really dealing with them a whole lot. So, and it's very easy to slip between the two sometimes, you know, without thinking about it, you know, am I, Am I coming alongside to you to help you or to make myself look good in your eyes? You know, that's, that's a very, very easy line to cross back and forth and more so than I'd like to admit. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we're starting to get into a little bit here on some of these, the way these show up and, and Justin, I appreciate that. And even one of the things that you said um, was, you know, you may be in a relationship with somebody or, or you're receiving, right? Whatever emotions they're putting out. And you, you mentioned that you've got some of those themes, those relationship themes that are more passive and then they, they take in, right? And you can't necessarily uh, close the door on those. Those doors are just open for those people that have that disposition. And so you do take that, take that in, you know, and one of the thoughts I think is, is just our Lord, retreated to the wilderness from time to time. He had to move away. I mean, there was times where, you know, folks, we just get tired, right? We, we, we just don't want to feel it anymore. And we hit a wall. It's, it's these talents are still embodied in a human being that is finite and needs to go to sleep and needs to eat something and needs to veg out from every once in a while and needs to pray, right? And so uh, all of these things are, are taking place, not in these angels that have no bodies and they have no need of sleeping, but we're, we're human persons that are incarnate, right? And falling back on this John Paul II, or falling back on this Catholic anthropology, we're body, soul composites, the body makes visible the invisible reality of, of the spirit and the divine, as John Paul II says in his theology of the body. So here we are, right? And in those moments, it's great to acknowledge when we've hit our points where we find ourselves just, you know, needing to tune, tune out. I call it now permission to be melancholic, right? <laughs> it's my secondary permission to be melancholic, right? And just kind of bounce off, retreat to the wilderness, Otherwise, we might end up putting demands on ourselves. And, and perhaps, I mean, it's, it just begs the question, too, if we find ourselves in that place where we're being asked by somebody to give what we don't have to give, the response is always love, right? The response to the human person is always love. And there's nothing wrong in the marital embrace. Let's use this analogy. There's nothing wrong when one person wants to show up and wants to initiate the marital embrace and the other person says, I'm just not in the mood. Nothing wrong with that. There's great dignity in that. There's nothing wrong with somebody shows up in the conversation and says, I want to talk about this, or I want to go deep here. And the other person says, no, thanks. <laughs> no, thanks. Right. In fact, it would be, it's, it's not like, well, no, you're not letting me live in my gift. No, you're getting an opportunity to temper, to tame your talent at that point, to tame your gift so that it can be maintained as a gift. Because the moment we force our talents on somebody else, it ceases to be a gift at that point. Patrick says, thank you, Justin, for sharing those darker emotions. They touch a place in myself. I uh, need to face and reflect on them. Yes, folks, the proper approach even to ourselves, right? When we grow aware of just kind of this own interior experience of how our how our talents are showing up in certain circumstances or how they're not showing up, how they're kind of like retreating in those moments, just an opportunity to suspend judgment, particularly of ourselves. Let's get a little bit curious, right? And so this is just some of my thoughts, okay? The vicious mindset that can often be behind 
overuse patterns or going vicious with our relationship themes. I'll feel blank when the other person does blank, says blank, whatever. Again, that's that emotional childhood that we talk about a lot at Metanoia Catholic. Um, it's when we put the locus of control of our own emotional life outside of ourselves, which is not where it is in reality. It's inside of ourselves, right? Can't control our emotions, but we can control, we can choose what we think, all right? Which can incline us to experience these emotions, right? Uh, but where we go this way, uh, I feel blank when the other person does this, then we're just going to go manipulative. And then this is another one that I think shows up quite a bit. And I don't know if anybody can kind of add in on this one. I don't want to jeopardize the relationship. I often think this, folks. I often think this, especially when I'm evangelizing. I can't, won't jeopardize the relationship. And what do I mean by that? when I'm evangelizing, I, I, I feel taught that often inclined to water down, perhaps, the truth, or to put the relationship with a person above the reality of what the Lord has spoken, right? Doesn't mean that we're show up as clamoring gongs. But it doesn't mean that we are there to sympathize with somebody when they, we'd be sympathizing with a lie, ultimately. I can't, I won't jeopardize the relationship. I've seen this even show up when I was, I remember I was coaching a, um, a group and it was a development team. They had an amazing mission of going out and uh, doing some amazing work. And there were people on the team that thought when they would ask somebody for money, it would jeopardize the relationship. And so they wouldn't ask. And think about that. Like, I don't want to jeopardize the relationship. First of all, we have to kind of challenge that. If I say this, if I show up authentically, is that really going to challenge a relationship? Or, or might it actually pave the way for authentic relationship? How often do we find ourselves uh, settling into what we call a relationship, that's not, we're not even showing up authentically. It's not even a real person. We're not even a real, we're not even liking the other person. We're not, you're not seeing the other person. You're not allowing yourself to be seen. Okay. So in order for these things, we've touched on this quite a bit to kind of wrap up our session here today. Uh, if we want to live virtuously in these relationship themes, ultimately the desire, right? And we can see how this is nested on the way to beatitude, the beatific vision, when we're in communion with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all eternity, where we are that spotless bride, right? The church, that spotless bride that is entering into communion with the divine relationship. How might our themes, our talents show up here and now? that start to be a little bit of a glimpse, a little bit of reflection, a little bit of a foretaste of that divine communion that we're called to rest in ultimately. How will we make our marriages image the free, total, and faithful union of the beatific vision? How might our work relationships be a better image of that free, total, faithful union of the beatific vision? How might the same thing with our kids be an image of that free, total, faithful, fruitful union? That total gift of self is going to require an awareness of self and a possession of self for the total donation of self. So this is the work that we're doing the mindset work we're doing at Metanoi Catholic is we are searching our interior life for those areas that for which we do not have dominion. We have not claimed the blood of Christ in those areas of our lives where perhaps, you know, the enemy still has a foothold or, or flesh or the world has a foothold in our lives. When we identify these areas where we are in bondage, and we bring them to the blood of Christ, and we experience freedom, now we are able to possess 
that area of ourselves for what end? To give that aspect of ourselves. Self-awareness is not the end. Self-awareness is the step towards self-possession. Self-possession is not the end. Self-possession is meant for self-donation. And resting in the relationship, that's where, that's what you relationship people, these people that use, use guys that lead with relationship themes, that is what your life speaks to the world. A desire to rest in an authentic relationship, to be real, to go deep, to be seen, to see the other. Beautiful to include the other. Beautiful. Any closing thoughts I see here? Ah, uh, yeah. Justin says that jeopardize the relationship, big driver in this domain. Um, Justin, go ahead, man. Now, I was just going to say what kind of jumps out to me, this is in my mind, a lot of this rolls up to under the, the virtues that fall under justice, where you're recognizing another person for who they are and rendering to them what they deserve, what they are due. Um, and just, you know, and the flip side of justice obviously is mercy. And anytime you go to one extreme or another, there's always problems. But I think this theme, when it's those who really have these strengths and, and live in this, they are, they are just in every sense of the word that they they see people for who they are and love them to the degree that they need um, just naturally. And it's a beautiful thing to be jealous of when, <laughs> if you don't have that. So, uh, uh, so yeah, if you, if you find those people, uh, definitely, uh, definitely appreciate them. Awesome. Awesome. Justin, great words. And folks, don't you worry if you don't lead with your relationship themes or you don't have a relationship theme in your entire top 10, Introgen A. Franco. Uh, we can, uh, don't worry. Like you image God in a way that the world needs. The world needs it just as much as these amazing relationship themes. And we're going to celebrate your, your domains here in, uh, in some coming podcasts. Janae, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, you, you kind of hit it right on the head there. Um, I wanted to speak up for those of us who do not necessarily lead with these themes, uh, because at least in my mind, I can tend to go very black and white. And it can be easy to look at, as you can see in my, my top 10, um, connectedness is my only relationship in my top 10. I followed by One out of 10. There you go. <laughs> One out of 10. Uh, and so I could say a lot about relationship, but I'll keep it simple, is that like we're all built for relationship, right? This is something you reminded me of, Matt, actually at a, at a time that I really needed to be reminded of that. And especially in the last few months, I've been doing, God's been doing a lot of work in me about renewing that. And, and I think for me, what's beautiful about those who lead with relationship is those things that we kind of all want, they just do so subconsciously, like Justin said, like there's just something so beautiful about how easily and effortlessly it is for them to be in relationship with others. And it's not something that comes super, naturally to me being, you know, higher influencing and higher strategic thinking. Um, it's something that can quite easily take it, take the back burner. And it's, it's something that takes a little bit more work on my part, but it's op absolutely worth it. Like you said, we're all built for relationship. We all need relationship and yeah. And so it's just been really beautiful to do this work and to see even how I was uh, on a call recently and I was kind of asking because I think Simon was talking about relationship and I was like, well, you know, I have two, but I feel like when I hear I'm 17 or later and I'm 19 empathy. So D, his wife was saying basically like you can access any of your, of your top 20, you know, that's all. If you don't have a lot of relationship, you're going to go straight to the ones that you do have to sort of mm -hmm. to utilize. And so I thought that was really interesting as well is to, um, don't be blind to those that might be still in your top 20, but not in your top 15, that those are still probably going to be at play when it comes to relationships for you. So. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And we know that some of those, some of those other themes have, a, have an ability of coming together and uh, having a little theme baby, so to speak, that really images some of the, uh, uh, some of the other themes, right? God would not create us for a relationship and not give us the desire uh, or the tools to rest in that relationship. Awesome. Uh, 
compassion is always still accessible, right? That's a choice. I love that, Michelle. Thank you for adding that. Such deep waters. Yes, of course. And your appreciation to that is even drawing upon that supporting theme of relator, right? That's in your 18, you said, Suzanne. But nonetheless, yes, these things are still, all of these talents are accessible to us. The order just kind of, uh, it gives it sheds a little bit light on, on whether or not they're just in that place of conscious or unconscious competency when we're living in those things. But nonetheless, folks, thank you so much for your contribution to the podcast. Uh, if you would love to learn more about how to tame some of your strengths, we are doing that in the Metanoia Catholic Academy. We have certainly this podcast that's going out, but every other week when we're not publishing a podcast, we are doing strengths coaching. So bring your signature themes, reports to the call, have a goal in mind, and we will coach in those strengths. How might we, uh, how might we summon those talents that you have available to us or invest in some of those talents so that they might grow into strengths through skills and knowledge so that you can be that gift, that sincere gift uh, for the world. We need your gift. All right. Like and subscribe. God bless you all.